So I first want to thank you all for being here today because it's a very important talk on many different levels and I really appreciate you all coming out and supporting. So I want to thank uh, our co-sponsors, our institutional sponsors, CNES, Secondary Studies, Columbia Hill and Brian Peterberg, and Gender Studies, Jenny Schott, Michelle, Irai, and Michelle Gomez, who really helped get this going. Um, Michelle Irai kind of attacked that scene and she told me to go with it, so I'm really um, grateful to the department for supporting this important talk. And then I also want to thank, there are three graduate kind of groups that have helped us. You guys come on, please come in and have a seat. Thank you. Um, so we have the CNES Grad Council, the Sociology um, Gender Working Group, as well as the Gender Studies Grad Council. So um, much, much appreciation to you all. Um, okay, so. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our fantastic speaker. It's really apropos that she's here today, during Palestine Awareness Week, although this is not an SJP event. Um, it's really appropriate that um, Dr. Elia is here joining us for this fantastic talk as well. Okay, so uh, Neda Elia is Professor of Global and Gender Studies at um, Ali Kalk University in Seattle. She is a Shabazz Palestinian, born in Iraq, raised in Beirut, Lebanon, where she received her BA and MA, and worked as a journalist before coming to the United States to do her PhD. Professor Elia is the author of the book, Trances, Dances, and Vociferations, Agency and Resistance in Africana Women's Narratives, and guest editor of a special issue on the Second Intifada of the Radical Philosophy Review, a journal of progressive thought. Professor Elia is also a member of the Insight Women of Color Against Violence National Collective, which edited two anthologies, The Color of Violence and The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. She Fun. has funded, excuse me. <laughs> She also has numerous publications in various progressive alternative media venues, from Electronic Intifada, uh, Left Turn Magazine, as well as some of the most prestigious academic journals, including World Literature Today, the Journal of the National Women's Studies Association, Kayalu, and Modern Fiction Studies. An activist, uh, excuse me, a scholar activist, Professor Elia is past president of AMU, the Association of Middle East Women's Studies, and serves on a number of grassroots activist organizations. She is a founding member of Rowan, the Radical Arab Women's Activist Network, a former representative in the United Nations of OSA, the Arab Women's Solidarity Association, a member of the Defense of Civil Rights in Academia, and co-chair of the Anti-Militarism, Anti-Occupation anti 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 Task Force of Insight. Lastly, but definitely not least, Professor Elia currently serves on the organizing committee of the U.S. Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, crisscrossing the U.S. and Canada, to promote the boycott and explain its pragmatic implementation details. She was instrumental in getting the 300 plus member, um, member groups of the US campaign to end Israeli occupation to endorse the principle of academic and cultural boycott. And without further ado, please do welcome uh, Professor Nadia. So thank you to all of the groups that Anna just named who uh, are co-sponsoring me. It's really, I mean, it's, it's very, very empowering to know that all of these groups have come together to uh, co-sponsor a talk. In some ways, that why we need so many, but at the same time, that it's really fabulous that so many would come together for a talk. Um, how do I get to my point? I am trying to. <coughs> so, uh, sorry. So. Got it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Washing, refusing to be complicit and not clear our eyes. Uh, I think washing is uh, not about breast cancer. It's a major strategy that uh, Israel is uh, using to uh, to exploit basically the good intentions of uh, liberals for purposes of covering up the apartheid and colonialism. So, uh, for many decades in this country, in the U.S., Palestinians were only known through one lens, that of Zionism, which viewed us as subhuman, undesirable, a population that should not exist. But even as I say that, you know, and I'm thinking of all the narratives that, that major, well, very well-known slogan of, you know, that, that Palestine is a land without a people, for people without a land, and that we shouldn't exist, and that if we exist, we're very undesirable. It's really important to know that actually the Zionist narrative does not, did not start with the claim of Israel, uh, Palestine is a land without a people for a people without a land. Uh, the Zionist discourse, as it evolved over the, sen the, the decades or even the centuries, uh, because the first Zionist uh, plans were actually articulated back in the 1800s, in the late 1800s. So it's not, you know, as a, much as we think of Zionism and the creation of Israel as a post-Holocaust development, and most people do think of it as, well, we needed to create a safe state for the Jews after the Holocaust, the idea of the creation of uh, a, a, a Jewish nation actually goes back to the late 1800s and it was at the height of uh, imperial expansion. And Zionism, early Zionism, was very comfortable with the fact that it was a colonialist movement. It totally identified and called itself a colonialist movement, modeled upon the European colonization of various countries, including very consciously the, North Ameri the European colonization of North America. So it wasn't like, okay, we, you know, coming out of the Holocaust, we have to find a safe space. It was like, okay, there's European expansion and settler colonialism, and let's do that part too. Um, so Vladimir Jabotinsky, and here's, uh, who was obviously, those are his dates, 1880 to 1940, uh, speaks of Zionism as colonialism very, very articulately in a whole book. He says, uh, 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 and I'm, I'm quoting a bigger thing out of this, out of which it is taken. He says, every reader of his book on Zionist colonization yeah. has some idea of the early history of other countries <coughs> which have been settled. I suggest that he recall all known instances. If he should attempt to seek but one instance of a country settled with the consent of those born there, he will not succeed. The inhabitants, no matter whether they are civilized or savages, have always put up a stubborn fight. It is of no importance whether we quote Herzl or, Samuel Hem uh, or Herbert Samuel to justify our activities. Colonization itself has its own explanation, integral and inescapable, and understood by every Arab and every Jew with his wits about him. Colonization can only have one goal. For the Palestinian Arabs, this goal is inadmissible. Zionist colonization even the most restricted must either be terminated or carried out in defiance of the will of the native population. So Jabotinsky is one of the early Zionist thinkers. Look at his dates, and he was like elaborating on how the colonization of Palestine is going to be carried out against the wishes of the Palestinian people. It is absolutely unthinkable to think that they would possibly accept it, but this is how colonialism happens and we are a colonial endeavor, and we're going to go settle, and every person with his wit about him, his or her wit about him, Arab or Jew, un must understand that colonialism is something that the natives do not like, but we're going to do it anyway. So clearly, despite the fact that so the younger generation, the post-Holocaust generation, the 60s and, uh, and beyond generation, is most familiar with Palestine is a land without a people for a people without a land. Clearly, what we see is that Jabotinsky absolutely realized that there were Palestinians for whom the colonization of their land was inadmissible. And he was still going to go ahead. Uh, another example, uh, in 1897, two rabbis from Europe also went to visit, and they described Palestine, I don't think I have a slide about that, as a beautiful bride 
but married to another man. Oh. A beautiful bride, but married to another man. Again, there are people there, and they have an attachment to the land. A beautiful bride, but married to the, another man. We can't go and marry that beautiful bride. Uh, so there's also an acknowledgement that there was a civilization there, a long-standing relationship between the land of, and the people. And there are multiple such examples of acknowledging that the Palestinian people are there and are attached to their land, and that the early Zionist vision was a settler colonial vision. We're going to go there, we know there's people, but we're going in, just as all colonial endeavors went places knowing that this was not, you know, a deserted, abandoned land, peopleless land, but they still went ahead and colonized because that was, you know, that's colonialism. And uh, it's not until the 60s when that Zionists actually started to deny our existence and to distance us from our homeland. This is where finally we start hearing things like the land without a people for a people without a land. And we have to understand that that, which became the most common depiction of Palestine, uh, in some ways, it's like it's uh, it's interesting to look at that statement: "The land without a people for a people without a land." Because when it was being said, it was primarily because the rest of the world was waking up to the fact that colonialism and colonization is not a civilizing mission; it's a violent mission of ethnic cleansing and dispossession <coughs> and disenfranchisement. So, so really, you know, like a land. But also, at the time, Palestine was indeed becoming, through the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians from their villages, in some ways, a land without a people. Uh, so there, you know, with 48, in 1948, when, when, when Israel was founded in Palestine, it was founded on the ruins of 450 uh, Palestinian villages that were totally destroyed, and a full 80% of the people became refugees, mm -hmm. and are refugees to this day. So today, the, the numbers have changed a little, so that today we have you know, the population in Israel, that is not including the West Bank and, and Gaza, is 20% uh, Palestinian, people who have never left. Mm -hmm. But those 20% Palestinian who have never left actually represent 15% of the <coughs> entire mm -hmm. Palestinian population. Mm -hmm. So when we think of the dispossession, that displacement, the statement, Palestine is a land without a people for a people without a land, it was a distancing from the violence of colonialism that actually did push the people away, so it's a denial, but it also, in reality, the people had been pushed away. Mm -hmm. They had become refugees, so that to this day, 85% of the Palestinian people lives outside of, you know, internally displaced. When we think of the West Bank and Gaza, we have to understand <coughs> that in the West Bank and Gaza, there are refugee camps. Gaza, the population in Gaza, which is one of the most densely populated uh, parts of the world. Oh, look, I have a ticker, a timer. Oh my gosh, I'm already, I've already spoken eight minutes. I've never had a ticker on my computer before. That's the Matt versus Dad. That was, I, I <laughs> All right, I need a Mac. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so Gaza, for example, the, the, the population in Gaza is 80% refugees. In, in, in the West Bank, there are refugees. So we're you know, the land without a people for a people without a land is, is a very, very loaded uh. statement. Uh, so again, uh, because in the 60s, the, the global discourse, on, or I would say the Western hegemonic discourse on colonialism, because of course the global, the, the indigenous never really thought of colonialism as a civilizing mission, but the hegemonic discourse had shifted sufficiently to actually say that colonialism isn't necessarily a civilizing mission. So that's when, basically, the Israeli the Zionist official uh, discourse of, uh, of Israel became very uh, vehement about the denial of the Palestinian people, to the point where we have in 1969, Golda Meir, who was then president, uh, prime minister, actually said such, there were no such thing as Palestinians. Uh, this is an interview with a reporter in The Guardian, and he asked her, so how do you feel as a prime minister who claims to be into humanitarian and you know, you're, the, you're the humane prime minister, how do you feel about the fact that you know, the Palestinians are refugees? And she said, there were no such things as Palestinians. When was there an independent Palestinian people with a Palestinian state? It was either 
southern Syrians before the First World War, and then it was a Palestine, including Jordan. It wasn't though, though as there was a Palestinian people in Palestine considering itself as a Palestinian people, and we came and threw them out and took their country away from them. They did not exist. So that's the Israeli Prime Minister completely negating the existence of a Palestinian people. And it's interesting because, I mean, a, very, a lot of us Palestinian activists say Golda Meir said the Palestinians did not exist. But there's actually a, a, an analysis of this statement, which is, again, an imposition of the Eurocentric concept of the nation state. So the, the nation state, you know, Palestinians did not exist as an independent nation state. That is correct. Does it mean that they did not identify with the, with the land? Does it mean that they didn't know, they did not have a cultural distinction from the Jordanians and the Syrians and the Lebanese? They did have that. They were not a nation state as a result of the way uh, the geopolitics uh, of, the, of the region were then. And because the nation state itself is actually a modern European concept. But it's, oh. it's like saying, you know, just because they didn't have a nation state, which is what Golda Meir is saying here, it's not like there was a Palestinian people in Palestine considering itself a Palestinian people. Her projection is there was no nation state called Palestine. But that's in some ways like saying that the Native Americans in North America did not exist because they did not have borders and a flag. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the concept of the nation state. Were they not dispossessed? Were they not colonized? Did they not identify? Did they not have a very clear distinction of where the Navajo country ends and where whatever, I mean, I, I, from Seattle, I know the Duwamish and the Snohomish and the whatever. And they know very well where Duwamish ends and where Muckleshoot starts and where Snohomish starts and where Snoqualmie ends. They had that concept. They identified with a certain land. It wasn't a nation state. Similarly with the Palestinians, it wasn't a nation state, which is a very modern European concept. But they knew they were Palestinian, which is why to this day they haven't, you know, I mean, much as Israel would really like us to think of ourselves as Jordanians, we don't think of ourselves as Jordanians. We are Palestinian and we have that identity. But the denial was there. If they did not exist as a, Palestine, as a nation state, then they didn't exist. So much so that we have Golda Meir said they did not exist. We did not dispossess the Palestinians. They did not exist. Um, so then, uh, okay, oh, so you really can't deny that they didn't exist because there's all these millions of Palestinian refugees. So then the discourse shifts again to a justification for the greater good. And we have someone like uh, Benny Morris, an Israeli historian, who acknowledges that, yes, the Palestinians did exist, and we did dispossess them, but it was for a greater good. And here's this uh, in quote. Even, uh, okay, I'm going to read something longer than this. I feel sympathy for the Palestinian people, which truly underwent a hard tragedy. I feel sympathy for the refugees themselves. But if the desire to establish a Jewish state here is legitimate, there was no other choice. Even the great American democracy could not have been created without the annihilation of the Indians. There are cases in which the overall final good justifies harsh and cruel acts that are committed in the course of history. So this is the evolution of the colonialist discourse from, you know, we're going to do it. Who cares? <laughs> to, we didn't do it. <laughs> to, we did it, but for the greater good. And now that you know we did it for the greater good, and that there's no denial of the fact that you know it was it for the greater good, and uh, you know does the end justify the means, and what do we make of the millions of refugees and the violation of the human rights of the Palestinians, and so on, lots and lots of research. You know, um, I would credit a lot of the activists. I would credit some of the scholars, absolutely Edward Said. You know, his like his whole body of work documenting the Palestine question, creating the field of, uh, of uh, comparative, uh, of, uh, you know, post-colonial studies. So finally now it's like, okay, there's, this was not for the greater good. This was, you know, a, a major wrong that was done. And uh, Israel is violating the rights of the Palestinians, the human rights. Uh. And so finally, Israel is no longer viewed as the victim. And it's not, you know, there's what? 
accuser is no longer viewed as the victim. What, what a statement, <laughs> right. Uh, it's no longer viewed unquestionably as the, the country that really just had to do it. And, uh, and uh, you know, so Israel is actually working hard today at fixing its image. It's really important to know that Israel is on the defensive. It's very much on the defensive now because there have been sufficient documentation of the fact that Israel actually has done great wrongs, including Benny Morris saying, you know, we've, you, we have been engaged in harsh and cruel acts. I mean, that's what this statement says. Mm -hmm. We have engaged in harsh and cruel acts. So on the defensive, Israel is trying to actually fix its image at this point. And this is where pinkwashing comes in, as an attempt to fix Israel's image. Um, so Israel has, for the longest time, been considered a, a democracy in the West because the West had not questioned the Zionist narrative. And the Zionist narrative was very, very, the Zionist apparatus was very careful not to allow for Palestinian counter discourse. And again, because of global dynamics, because the Zionist narrative is a European narrative that resonates more with the colonialist uh, discourse, uh, the Zionist narrative had more of a welcome reception here than the Palestinian counter discourse, which was that, you know, well, how do we hear that Palestinian discourse, that harsh accented voice that we don't <laughs> understand, that speaks in terms that we don't relate to, whereas the Zionist narrative is presenting itself, well, we understand colonialism, we understand the greater good, we understand expansion, we do have the Holocaust and, you know, the genocide of the Jews that we have to repent over. So, so the Zionist discourse was very well, very much positioned at an advantage to be heard here. And now the Zionist discourse is putting itself, in, uh, has shifted to where it has to be actually on the defensive. And part of the defensive is a further shutting down of the Palestinian counter discourse. At first, the there wasn't much there wasn't much need to actually shut down the Palestinian counter discourse because it wasn't heard. Because of the nature of the Palestinian counter discourse, it wasn't likely to be heard. As it became heard through the activism of scholars and of Palestinians who finally, like, you know, made it, uh, broke through uh, whatever that, I, I don't want to say that it was censorship at first, it became censorship as the Palestinian discourse broke through. And so today, there is a de definite deliberate attempt on the part of the Zionist apparatus to actually shut down the discourse in ways such as, like, you know, you can't use the word apartheid. It's very, very dangerous. You know, like all of the resistance to, to such things as the word apartheid, shutting down the discussion of BDS, because BDS is known to be the strategy that ended apartheid. So if you're asking for the strategy that ends apartheid, then of course you are assuming that it's apartheid, so let's not talk about BDS, because BDS is the strategy to end apartheid, and we don't even want to go there, because we're not an apartheid state, we're a democracy. Uh, so we have all of that, you know, the, the dynamics of why there is censorship, why at first there was so much of a welcome reception to Zionist uh, discourse. Today, information is becoming a lot more democratic with social media, the censorship is actually, it's harder to censor all of the information coming through. The social media does evade mostly the Zionist and the corporate censorship. A lot of people, more and more and more people are getting that, uh, their information, not from the TV at seven or whatever the news is, you know, in the evening you sit down and you watch the news. People are getting their information 24 seven through Twitter, through Facebook, through all of that social media, documentation, cell phones, videos that are uplo uploaded, all of that. So it's really hard to evade the, the information that's coming out. And as a result, Israel is actually working over time to fix its image by projecting itself more than ever as a vibrant society characterized by artistic and technological accomplishments rather than by all of the violence that we are becoming aware of. And one way that it can project itself as a vibrant democracy, as something that the Americans can relate to, is as a gay-friendly country. So it's actually working on a glamorous face, a mask to distract, which is where the pinkwashing comes from. So it's a mask to distract from the reality that is somehow coming through, because most people today, even the Zionists, you know, everybody, everybody is becoming aware on a daily basis. We're almost bombarded 
with news of the violence that's coming out of Palestine, uh, you know, the violence against the Palestinians. So Israel has to respond with a greater uh, effort at propaganda. And it is propaganda because what it's doing is it's fixing the image, it's not fixing the policies. None of the policies that have ruined Israel's image are something that Israel is addressing. So there is still ongoing, as I speak, prisoners being tortured, prisoners on hunger strike, home demolitions as I speak, villages probably being destroyed as I speak, greater expansion in East Jerusalem as I speak. All of the things that have hurt Israel's image, Israel is not addressing. What it is addressing is its image. And its image, again, in ways that we could uh, relate to. And in fact, its image is being worked on by American marketing firms. It has used American marketing firms, which specialize in image making. And uh, so Israel's three most powerful ministries, the foreign ministry, the prime minister's office, and the finance ministry, have actually hired some of the top uh, American marketing firms and come up together with branding is brand Israel, which was actually officially adopted and it's like a very, very uh, generously funded program, funded by these three ministries, the foreign minister, the prime minister's office, and the finance ministry, and it's called the Brand Israel, and it was officially adopted in 2005, and it was adopted after the marketing research said, you know what, There's Israel's image is being seriously challenged here. You gotta do something about the image. And the image was, okay, so we're going to appear to the liberals, not to the conservatives, because the conservatives are already on board Israel. You know, the fundamentalist Christians, the, all of that, uh, the uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews, they're already Zionists. So we're losing the battle for Israel's image in the liberal circles, not in the conservative circles. So the people we have to appeal to are within the liberal circles, and that's why we appeal to, for example, uh, the, the gays, and, and the gay is, uh, becomes our market. Uh, the other slide later about uh, the gay market is actually one of our targets, mar target markets. So it's happening on campuses a lot. For example, Wayne Firestone, who is the president of Hillel uh, International, Okay, I have this poster which it, from 1936. It doesn't belong right here in the presentation, but I have it somewhere. Can we, you know, again, 1936, Franz Kaufmann was a German artist who went and his, he made this very famous poster, Visit Palestine, which again, A, identifies Palestine, and then shows it as clearly a civilized urban, if, if urban means anything. I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily a, a higher category, but clearly we have a city here, uh, Jerusalem. And so again, an acknowledgement that what you're visiting is an entity that exists. But I think, yeah, this is what I wanted. So Wayne Firestone, who's the executive, at the time he was executive VP of Hillel, now he's president of Hillel International. And he actually said, we need to rebrand Israel to portray it as a place where there are cool hate people. Mm -hmm. away, from, away from all of the images of violence, we need to project Israel as a place where there are cool hit people. And uh, Hillel, along with IPAC, is actually uh, working on campus events, lots of campus events that present Israel as a cool hit people, uh, as a place where there are cool hit people. And again, what I want to emphasize, because it's really important, is that uh, what Israel is doing is fixing its image, not the policies that have tarnished the image. So uh, Ari Mikan, who's the Israel, his Israeli <coughs> cultural affairs, okay, he has a bigger title, what is his bigger title? Israeli Foreign Ministry's Deputy Director General for C Cultural Affairs. Okay. Israeli Foreign Ministry's Deputy G Director General for Cultural Affairs, he explained, we will send well-known novelists and writers overseas, the Euro companies exhibits this way, you show Israel's prettier face, so our, we are not thought of purely in the context of war. So we do see the Foreign Ministry actually engaging in sending out the cool hip people to distract from uh, the reality of Israel in the context of war. 
And within that context of rebranding Israel as a place where there are cool, hip people with lots of wonderful theater companies and exhibits and a very pretty face, this is where rebranding Israel, uh, this is where the gay market comes in. And the gay market actually is intended to show Israel as the more civilized place because, okay, so. Uh, uh, harm has been done, but at least it's for the greater good because at least Israel is gay-friendly, unlike the homophobic Palestinians. So Israeli pinkwashing then becomes a method, and uh, I'm quoting from Jaspir Poir here, a, a, a method through which the terms of Israeli occupation of Palestine are reiterated. Israel is civilized, Palestinians are barbaric, homophobic, uncivilized, suicide bombing fanatics, even though the last uh, suicide bombing didn't happen, you know, the first one didn't happen until 19. 94, and the last one happened a few years ago, but that's still the image that Israel is, is trying to project. So then pinkwashing projects Israel as the only gay-friendly country in an otherwise very hostile region. And this, this pinkwashing actually has a lot of consequences on the ground. It actually, first, it denies that there is homophobia in Israel, and homophobia, of course, is, I mean, I don't know that there are any countries where there is no homophobia. I don't know. I mean, Israel is likes to think of itself as the exception in many ways, but it is not an exception to homophobia. There is homophobia in Israel, which is completely denied when Israel projects itself as gay-friendly. So there's a denial of the Israeli homophobic oppression of its own gays and lesbians, and it also recruits gays, unwittingly recruits gays who want to be on the side of a gay-friendly country. It recruits them into this image of Israel is actually a good civilizing country and a positive uh, factor in the region. But what it's doing, it's actually reproducing the Orientalist tropes of you know the, the people, those barbaric people that we need to civilize with all of the sexual connotations of sexual backwardness and uh, the homophobia and everything. But it also is, I think of it as the 21st century manifestation of the Orientalist gendered look because mm -hmm. Prior to that, it was a matter of saving brown women from mm -hmm. the brown men. Now it's a matter of saving the brown gays from primarily the brown men. Uh, gays as in gay, why, not gays, you know. So it's a matter, so the 21st century manifestation of colonialist gendered analysis, which actually, it's not only in, in Israel that it's happening. But in Israel, it's very, very strongly, let's save the gays. But we see it throughout California, Africa, you know, various African countries where we're also out to save the gays, you know, with everything that saving the gays entails. You know, we're not homophobic, they're homophobic, we need to save the gays, the white, uh, the white liberals burden. It's no longer the white man's burden, it's the burden of the white gay international to save the gays elsewhere, and this is where being washing comes in. Uh, so Palestinians are responding to that with their own uh, LGBT organizations <coughs> that say, no, 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 don't, you know, this is all part of the same dynamic of colonialist oppression, gender colonialist expression, oppression, and we know how to deal with it, or we know better, you know, and so. Uh, th there are numerous Arab LGBT organizations that have, you know, for, for decades negotiated the personal and the political spheres of sexual identity under occupation and apartheid. So, and what they're saying is that Israel may be actually gay friendly for its own tourists and for its own uh, privileged people, but it is not gay friendly for the Palestinians. You know, by, ba by denying the absolute basic inalienable human rights of Palestinians, Israel is the greater purveyor of institutionalized violence and oppression for all Palestinians, regardless of their sexuality. So queer Palestinians, for example, the, the queer Palestinians that we need to save, actually are, are not at an advantage. You know, if anything, there are lots of ways in, the, in which the queer Palestinians are actually further exploited by Israel. So, uh, so the, it's, they are fighting a struggle against homophobia within Palestinian culture, like all spheres do, but they're, they're also fighting Israel's colonization of their land. So they're fighting multiple battles. And Israel is not gay friendly for the Palestinians. If anything, Israel actually exposed them. So for example, uh, a lot of queer Palestinians 
are suspected of being collaborators with the Israeli occupation. And there is some degree of truthfulness to that because what Israel does in exploiting Palestinian homophobia is if it knows of a Palestinian, if it suspects, you know, every Palestinian is spied on somehow, you know. So if there's any uh, suggestion, any suspicion that someone is gay, they get arrested and then they are threatened with being outed. So if you are outed as a gay, yes, there may be serious consequences, a threat to your life, so then you become a collaborator. So why Israel claims to be gay friendly, but is actually exploiting the Palestinian gays by threatening them to out them. And so some of them do indeed become collaborators, just as a lot of the people who are arrested, not a whole lot, but a certain percentage of the people who are arrested do become collaborators. And that percentage does include gays. But because of that additional uh, factor, that additional variable, the gays become collaborators, and the gays become accused of being collaborators, and that actually increases the homophobia and all of that, you know. So, so we're actually, by pretending to be gay friendly, it is A, only gay friendly to its own people, it's gay friendly to the gay market, and it's actually aggravating the circumstances of gays in Palestine. And it's a manifestation of 21st century colonialist, orientalist discourse about how homophobic these are. And, and so, uh, and it's erasing, completely erasing the, the native experience, including the experience of the gays, all of that by projecting itself as gay friendly. So there are multiple examples of pinkwashing that have happened. And uh, how long do I have for my whole talk? <laughs> An hour, okay, because I'm at 31. Like, and now that I have, a, <laughs> I have time. All right. Um, so Joel Lyon, who's Israel's Council for Media Affairs in New York City, actually said, "Gays are actually one of our target markets. Again, target markets for media affairs. Who are we reaching out to? Gays are actually one of our target markets." Um, and. And those of us who have been active, whether it's in queer circles and in the Palestine uh, uh, propaganda circles and whatever, a lot of us, like a few years ago, at about the time of Brand, Brand Israel, when Brand Israel was officially adopted, we started also getting a lot of like uh, emails and whatever. There was a time prior to that, I remember when I, uh, I don't know how many of you got that, at, you know, like those uh, sponsored ads. It used to say at the top of the sponsored ad, Israel, no one belongs here more than you. Do you, do you remember those? Israel, no one belongs here more than you. Which was like, oh my gosh, yes, it, it's true, yes, no one belongs here more than you. Absolutely. But that's not what they meant. <laughs> that's not what they meant. Uh, they meant, I don't know who they meant, but they didn't mean. <laughs> well, that stopped. That stopped. You know, I, I have not seen that message in many long years i remember always getting it and always being like yes you're right <laughs> but i know it's not what you mean now it's like there's a trickle of messages about gay tourism in, in, in israel and so on and so it, it's changed a lot to from maybe because they understood that yes we true yes nobody belongs there more than me and then they shifted the discourse because mm. like, no you don't belong so now it's gay tourism um, so there's a lot of uh, gay marketing that's going on. And it's going on on a number of levels, and I'm going to give just a few examples. So the first one that's, uh, that's happening is that I'm going to give, give examples from Canada, the US, and Israel itself. So the first example that I'm going to give is in Canada. Uh, the Toronto Pride Parade is one of the more uh, colorful, uh, biggest, rowdiest, uh, nakedest <laughs> <laughs> pride, par pride uh, parades of all. Uh, so the, and in the, at the, the Queers Against Israeli Apartheid, I believe, actually started in Toronto and is now uh, a, a more uh, continental uh, phenomenon. We've just, like in Seattle, just in the, this year, there's the beginning, the the beginning budding of a choir in uh, Seattle. But Queers Against Israeli Apartheid started
started, I believe, in Toronto. And every year they used to, they, like, when they applied to go into the Pride Parade, in 2008, so basically shortly after Grand Israel, shortly after the pink washing, shortly after uh, Joe Lyons said gays are actually one of our target markets, suddenly uh, there was, uh, they were told that they couldn't march in the parade anymore. So, uh, and, uh, and their participation was challenged by two groups, the Canadian Jewish Congress and the Bnai Breath. And those two groups had never before been any, in any way supportive of gay rights. It's not like these are gay right groups that are challenging them. These are uh, basically Zionist groups that are challenging them. And, uh, and they're challenging them from, so again, it's like it's really interesting that they're challenging them not because they are gay friendly, but because of the message of uh, against uh, against apartheid. It's like you cannot have the word apartheid in the in the parade. And some of the sponsors uh, of you know Bnei Breath and uh, and the Canadian Jewish Congress are very well known conservative Christian homophobic leaders, such as John Hagee and Charles McVeigh. In uh, Rabbi Reuven Balka, who is one of the co-presidents of the Canadian Jewish Congress, which was uh, which did not want choir in the parade, actually uh, is on the advisory committee of North, and North is the National Association for Research and Therapy of Homosexuality. You know, whenever you're doing research and therapy of homosexuality, and actually, it's an organization that believes that homosexuality is a psychological condition that can be cured through conversion therapy. So clearly an extremely homo homophobic organization. Let's cure homophobia, which is a disease through, uh, which is a psychological condition through conversion therapy. So they're not coming to it from a gay friendly approach. They're coming to it from an extremely homophobic, uh, <coughs> gay unfriendly approach, but they feel that they can stop something like choir. Uh, so, actually, <coughs> this backfired because Quaya, as a result, had any number of events, uh, lecturing, speaking, you know, educational meetings, teachings, and whatever. So it backfired, and they got uh, at first they, they did get to walk in the march, and also they got to expose pink washing for what it is. So it backfired there. Another. Uh, so that's one example. As I said, I'm going to give you a few examples. The other example that I want to talk about is uh, Men of Israel with Michael Lucas. So Michael Lucas is, uh, I, I hope you have, some of you have heard of him. He's a Russian-born uh, porn king. He actually is a, he has quite the varied background. He himself is an actor in uh, porn movies. He, is, he has become a director in porn movie, uh, of director of porn movies. He's Russian-born. He's now Israeli. He's very much of a Zionist, and he's very much a very very active in pink washing, and uh, and so he filmed one one movie called Men of Israel, which is actually uh, male gay pornography. <laughs> Men of Israel, and he talked about it on his website. He said, it's free PR for Israel, and it's much better than the PR they're getting on the news. So again, an acknowledgement of what news is coming out and what he can do for, for the image of Israel. Uh, nobody goes to Israel for Golda I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, so they're coming for the beauty of uh, gay men and women, not for Golda Meir. And so he filmed this movie, Men of Israel, this is taken from, uh, he made a, 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 this is from the movie, but uh, there are stills from the movie out, out of which he made a calendar that was actually available on Amazon. Uh, this is the 2011 calendar, made of Israel. 2011 wall calendar, every image, every month had one of the stills. Uh, I'm gonna show you the next one, it's even worse. Okay, uh, Men of Israel. So he talks about men of Israel and he says, he, he says, this is from his website, a ruined Palestinian village is the backdrop to steamy scenes in his gay movie. And he says, okay. He described his movie as a pornographic stimulus plan for Israel. I'm sure there's a double entendre there. Yeah. Pornographic <laughs> stimulus plan for Israel. And the <coughs> official homepage confirms this 
the global media has created an image of Israel as a war-torn nation with whose streets are lined with destroyed debris and crumbling ruins. Publicly broadcasted footage is always filmed in either Gaza or the West Bank, regardless of or not regardless of whether or not the story has a pro or Israeli angle. Or a pro or anti-Israeli angle. <coughs> and then he says Never are we shown Tel Aviv, Haifa, the Red Sea, the Dead Sea resorts, the beautiful beaches, the amazing architecture, and the embracing culture that allows its citizens to thrive. For this reason, other than showcasing the raw sexual prowess of Israel men, Lucas has also completed Men of Israel as a bold move to promote Israeli culture and tourism. This is from his website, from the website of Men of Israel. <coughs> So if you look at this one and the previous one, uh, they're actually, he said about them, he said, where's that? Huh. Probably here. I want to read the passage. Okay. So he wrote about the, the film Mad Men of Israel. <coughs> he wrote, we went to an abandoned village just north of Jerusalem. It was a beautiful ancient township that had been deserted centuries ago. However, that did not stop our guys from mounting each other and trying to repopulate it. Biology may not be the lesson of the day, but these men shot their seeds all over the village. So people who have watched the film said, I mean, a, an ancient, a beautiful ancient township that had been deserted centuries ago. And people recognized this as the village of Lifton, which had actually been ethnically cleansed in April 1948. This is not an ancient township that had been deserted centuries ago. This is a village that has been ethnically cleansed in 1948, that is filming this movie in. And he says, you know, the biology may not be the lesson of the day, but these men shot their seeds all over the village to repopulate it, trying to repopulate it. And again, if you want to repopulate the, the village, you bring back the refugees. But this is the kind of pinkwashing that's happening here. So you show beautiful gay men in an abandoned village trying to repopulate it. And basically, it's not a village that was abandoned centuries ago. It's a village that was ethnically cleansed, that the people wh whose inhabitants recognized it immediately, oh my gosh, this is Lipta, and we're refugees. And if you want to repopulate it, you stop denying us the right of return. We can repopulate it. This is our village. Uh, so this is how, you know, uh, how, one way that pinkwashing is also working by erasing the, the native experience by depopulating again. This was abandoned centuries ago. So that's, you know, so we've talked about Canada. This is how it's going in Israel. Michael Lucas is, of course, uh, you know, infamous for uh, his censorship here in the U.S. too. He's the one, uh, you know, like he's very, very well connected with uh, major funders in New York. And so Sarah Schulman, if you've read any of her work, Sarah Schulman is, uh, is, uh, has written a lot of, uh, she's a New York lesbian activist, scholar, uh, writer, author. She's got about like 15, actually more than 15 books. And her latest book is Palestine, Israel, the Queer International. It was just published a few months ago, in 2012. And uh, there's the LGBT Center in New York, and she asked for space to read. As, as, an, as a New York gay writer, she asked to read from her book, Author Reading, and the uh, LGBT Center in New York. And Michael Lucas said, no, you can't read there. And if the, LB, uh, if the center hosts you, I'm going to tell all the funders to actually stop funding. So there was a battle that, you know, a battle that's been going on for a very long time about can she even read from her book at, in New York, and she's done a whole lot of New York activism, and the answer was no, until just like only in the last few days, they finally said, okay, you can read. And it was Michael Lucas who was leading the opposition to her reading there. Uh, so that's an example. Again, so back in the U.S. also, how does pinkwashing work? So we've got at the, let's move away from these nasty pictures to something here. 
Sami Shamali is a, a Palestinian activist uh, with uh, Al Khaus, with Al Khaus, which is Arabic for uh, the Rainbow. It's a Palestinian organization, and he said, "There's no magic pink door in the apartheid wall." So, so I made the no entry. That is, this is my Photoshop. So, <laughs> I'm so proud of it because I'm like, I'm totally tech clumsy, but I managed to do this. <laughs> Because it's well, like this is such a beautiful quote, and I didn't want just a quote, I wanted an image with it. There's no magic pink door in the apartheid wall. So, uh, however, Israel does want to project the idea that there's a magic pink door in the apartheid wall. And one thing it did is again, by trying to deal again with the with the with the liberals. So, the, the USSF, the United States uh, Social Forum in 2010 in Detroit. Uh, Stand With Us, which I suppose some of you are familiar with, it's a very, very pro-Zionist Israel apologist organization, tried to infiltrate the U.S. social forum in 2010, and, uh, and so when there was a call for, for workshops, the Stand With Us actually sent in a workshop called LGBTQI Liberation in the Middle East, which was accepted. Uh, accepted by the USSF organizers who obviously did not know better than to read that red coin at standwithus.org. It was his email as he submitted that. Red coin at standwithus.org submits something on LGBTQI liberation in the Middle East that was all, as, you, as anyone who's in any way aware of pink washing, when you read the workshop description, this was a pink washing workshop. It was about how, uh, let's see, it offered information collected by such organizations as Amnesty International for participants to walk away with so that they can better educate their own communities about the realities in the Middle East. And those realities in the Middle East that they were going to be educated about was about homophobia in the Middle East and how Israel is the big savior. Uh, so Arab queers immediately responded. As soon as we saw that, as soon as we saw the program, you know, which was published, uh, where, you know, like a few weeks, I think, before the USSF was finally going to take place. And we saw this on the program you know, with, you know, like the, the speakers from Stand With Us is the only single, uh, single facilitated workshop because all of the workshops were facilitated by teams. And here was this one person only from Stand With Us with speaking about Arab homophobia without an Arab speaker, uh, you know, so. So a lot of the Arab organizations came together and they responded with a letter to the USSF called Arab Queers Say No to Israel and they explained. Since Israel's brutal wars on Gaza and Lebanon in 2006 and particularly after the recent unprovoked attack on the flotilla of activists going to Gaza, the Israeli government has found itself increasingly marginalized by international condemnations and weakened through the growing success of the World Cup Divestment and Sanctions campaign. To remedy this, it has launched a massive, a massive PR campaign using organizations such as, such as Stand With Us to convince the world that Israel is not a brutal secular colonial state, but rather a free democracy where human rights in general and LGBT rights in particular are respected and upheld. Stand With Us deceptively uses the language of LGBT and women's rights to obscure the fact that institutionalized discrimination is enshrined within the state of Israel. So Arab queers did come together very much and we talked and talked and talked to the organizers of the USSF, and we finally got them to cancel. And again, uh, we got them to cancel, and again, it was a learning lesson for the organizers that you know, there is no magic pink door in the apartheid wall, and that Palestinian women, uh, women and queers have been organizing, and that if, if anyone's going to hear us speak about homophobia, it better come from us, not from stand with us. Okay, so, uh, so Palestinian women and queers have long organized to counter sexism, homophobia, and colonialism, and have been extremely eloquent in our response to this exploitation of our challenging circumstances by Israel. And there are no excuses for feminists and gay rights activists in the US to accept Israel's propaganda, unless it's because these allies are not comfortable with Palestinian agency and with our analysis of our oppression as it, inter as it intersects with living under apartheid and occupation or in the diaspora. And Palestinian queers, I mean, a lot of the pinkwashing has actually brought together 
Palestinian queers and fe fe feminists and activists, and formed organizations, for example, such as uh, PQBDS, Palestinian Queers for BDS, and uh, as a result of pinkwashing, if it's anything, it has catalyzed even further uh, Palestinian queer activism, which existed prior to that. I mean, Al, uh, Al Qaus uh, was founded, I believe, in 1998, so before, you know, Al Qaus being Rainbow, being one of the most active uh, Palestinian queer organizations. It wasn't as a result of pink washing, but as a result of pink washing, it has catalyzed, galvanized, and brought together a lot of the activists. So now there's a, an umbrella group called Palestinian Queers for BDS, and they wrote, Israeli policies and occupation do not distinguish between queer and straight. All Palestinians, queer and straight, must deal with the effects of the apartheid law, checkpoints, and illegal settlements, and settlers' violence, not to mention living under Israeli military law that strips them of their rights as civilians. All Gazans, including queers, live under an Israeli siege in the de facto open-air prison, and that is the Gaza Strip. And like all Palestinian citizens of Israel, queers are subject to institutionalized discrimination in laws, education, and throughout their public and private lives. So start projecting Israel as gay friendly because as far as Palestinians are concerned, Israel is not gay friendly. There's the homophobia, there's the exploitation of homophobia, there's you know all of the exploitation of homophobia, including the attempt to turn Palestinian Jews into collaborators. So uh, members of the Palestinian queer community in Israel have long known that they are disenfranchised, not because they're gay, but because they're Palestinian. And gay is one additional uh, variable, but it's not a variable that negates their dispossession as Palestinians. And the politicization of Palestinian queers has always been complex. It addresses the macro environment of violence, which is living under occupation, living under apartheid, living in the diaspora. So that's the macro uh, environment and the micro environment of oppression. When Israel in its micro in Israel's pinkwashing addresses only the micro environment of oppression, namely Palestinian homophobia, and completely tries to erase the macro environment of oppression, which is Israel as a settler colonial state, as an oppressive uh, apartheid state that violates the human rights of all Palestinians, whether you're gay or not. So Israel focuses on the micro environment, and the Palestinian queers are saying, wait, we're fighting a very complex battle <coughs> here. There's the micro-environment, homophobia within our own culture, and there's the macro-environment. And both are the variables that we deal with. So, and they, so they're negotiating all of that. And, okay, so I'm going to try and uh, conclude now. Israel is a settler colonial country that openly violates another people's inalienable human rights. And as such, it is a country that has an image problem. And there are ways to fix that image. One way requires justice. You admit that the native population has been wronged, you redress the wrongs, you stop violating their human rights. That's one way to fix the image. You're actually fixing the problem that has tarnished the image. Israel is not doing that. The other way, which Israel has chosen, is a strictly cosmetic way, image. Uh, so it camouflages the violations, it distracts from the crimes. And pink washing is one way to distract from the crimes. And as Israel persists in its desire to be a Jewish state, it can only engage in the latter, which is image fixing rather than policy fixing. Because if you want to be a Jewish state, then you are an exclusivist state. And that is a problem. And so how do you fix that? You fix this, this policy or the image? Israel is fixing the image because it's the only way that it can be uh, a Jewish state. So its efforts to rebrand itself as a vibrant democracy that respects civil rights is then necess by necessity a cover up for the crimes that it is unrepentant for. It is not trying to change the, cri the crimes, it is trying to camouflage them. And what is needed is a remedy that goes beyond a smokescreen. A change in the very system is necessary so that Israel is no longer violating international law and attempting to, to distract our attention from these violations by exploiting the hard-won rights of queers as well as the ongoing homophobia many of us navigate daily. So pinkwashing is clearly not working. 
Members of the Palestinian queer community in Israel have long known that they are disenfranchised in Israel, not because they are gay, but because they are Palestinian. Their politicization has always been complex, addressing the macro as well as the micro environment of oppression. And queers around the world are also under understanding that gay rights are being used as an excuse to cover up violations of the human rights of the Palestinians. So queers around the world, when they understand that queer struggles are struggles against censorship, against discrimination, and against inequality, understand that this is basically what Israel is engaging in, and, and they are becoming. So this is an image that also that, that actually this is uh, queers in uh, Seattle made that image, not in our name, stop Israeli, oh, pink washing of the Israeli occupation. And now queers around the US <coughs> are using this, not in our name, stop Israeli pink washing of the uh, uh, illegal occupation of Palestine. I need to work on my slide. Um, so it's becoming now, uh, there is resistance on the part of the queer international, if I want to use Sarah Shulman's uh, uh, expression, against pinkwashing. So queers understand that artificial and arbitrary binaries are inherently oppressive and that no state that, insi that insists on institutionalized privilege of one community over another can ever be democratic. The challenge then is to work on liberation that is genuinely comprehensive rather than partial. It involves investigating alternatives to the Western model of homosexuality and sexual diversity in response to the unique historical, political, and cultural context in Palestine. It means envisioning a future based on respect for everyone's difference and a redefinition of sovereignty that embraces genuine diversity rather than the supremacy of some. Because civil rights should not trump human rights and because gay rights of Israelis cannot be served with the side of the apartheid against Palestinians. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have some time for questions. I think yes, there's a lot small enough, minutes. small enough of a room yeah. that I think everybody can just speak up and then so we can feel the question yourself. Well, thank you very much for that. My question is about the campaign against food washing. Seems to me it's been mainly the Palestinians in the diaspora and inside 48. Mm -hmm. To what extent is it taking off inside um, the West Bank and the camps in Lebanon? Uh, the dynamics of resistance within the West Bank, Gaza, and, the, uh, and the, the Arab diaspora, the refugee camps, are necessarily different. Mm -hmm. So pinkwashing is a campaign that addresses basically the West, which is why the resistance is coming from the West and from within Israel. It is not, pinkwashing is not directed at the refugee camps in Saudi Arabia. There are no, no. <laughs> so it's just like you know, it's not directed at the refugee camps in uh, in Lebanon, for example, and therefore the resistance would not be coming out of the refugee camps in Lebanon. It would be coming out of, and that's where, why it's coming out of a 48 Palestine and b the West, because when when Joe Ly uh, Lyon says the gay market is actually our target market, he's not thinking in the Palestinian camps in Lebanon. Well, can I follow up? Um, to what extent um, are there LGBTQ groups in uh, that are part of the vast civil society movement in mm -hmm. the West Bank in particular, but also to some extent in amongst the young people in the camps yeah. in Lebanon who are okay. really changing their thinking about so much? Within, within historic Palestine, the, you know, I mean, as much as physical movement is restricted, so it's primarily a political a alliance. Politically, they are very, very allied. In Lebanon, they're extremely active. I mean, there are lots of groups within Lebanon that are extremely active, uh, joint Palestinian and Lebanese, uh, you know, Nasaria, Helen, Helen, Helen Mim. Mim. 
you know, I can just name you quite a few groups, and yes, they're very, and, and I love their analysis. It is so complex. It is so, you know, I, I love what Nasaria is doing. Nasaria means feminine, right? You know? But it's, it's actually a, a primarily lesbian group in Lebanon, very mixed demographics, Lebanese and Palestinian, that is extremely active in its analysis of racism, homophobia, and its activism. So they, they do fabulous work. So yes, it's there. Yes. I'm trying to think of how to frame this question. Um, my name is Michelle Roman, and I work a little bit with the set. Well, I work a lot with settler colonialism. <laughs> but I'm thinking about how uh, queer indigeneity is co-opted in the United States by the very same groups that are being advertised in relation to pink washing in relation to that. I think it could be an interesting juxtaposition. And here I'm talking about the appropriation of the two-spirit movement or other movements or what Scott Morganson has termed settler home nationalism, mm -hmm. right? And how there's this like contradictory element that, um, <laughs> I, that it, it, it's, it's interesting to me that in the, the stop the pink washing movement, people can see that as a problem, but not also interrogate their own location in terms of their own settler status, even as queer subjects in the United States. And I was wondering if you, could, if you see the, the relationship between the two, or how 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 can we make that an ally movement? I guess is, is one of the questions that I have because I do see a lot of settler appropriation in relation to that, right? In, in the ways that both groups are temporalized. And, and this comes from a lot of issues that I have seen. Like I have literally, in graduate school, I had a professor say to me, even though I was in the class and I'm, I'm native, and um, Seneca, uh, say to me, the only difference between what happened in the US and Israel-Palestine was that it's happening now in Palestine, and what happened to the native people was 500 years ago, mm -hmm. right? Even though I'm still there as it's a colonial <laughs> subject in the present moment, right? Yes. And so in the, that way too, I guess there's a sort of white liberal aspect that also embraces Palestine, but doesn't interrogate their own location. That erases the ongoing reality yes. here. Where yes. colonization happens in Israel-Palestine, but cannot see how it's happening with the mm -hmm. Harper government in Canada. Mm -hmm. or, or what's going on here with the fracking, it can go on forever. But. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could speak to that a bit. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, uh, but I, I don't know that I would necessarily be adding to what, what your analysis is correct. It is ongoing, and there is co-optation frequently and an erasure <coughs> of the ongoing experience. Um, I think the one way that I would explain it is very often within activist communities, people are simply not aware of the fact that they are reproducing the dynamics around them. Mm -hmm. We tend to think as activists that we are immune to whatever discourse is out there. And I'm always thinking micro and macro. We think that our little micro community of activists, whatever our activism is, is immune to all of the power dynamics, all of the oppressive dynamics outside, because we are activists, you know, we get it. And the fact is, unless we are really intentional about being aware of everything and the fact that we do not function in a bubble, then in all likelihood, we are going to reproduce that discourse more sanitized because we've got the terminology. <coughs> and then, so it's a matter of becoming very intentional because without the intentionality, we are reproducing that discourse. And I see that a lot of the, uh, a lot of the communi communist, uh, communist, communist, <laughs> activist communities, <laughs> the activist communities that are primarily directed at one social ill, whatever it is, tend to become completely oblivious to the other social ills. So if you are f fighting homophobia, you tend to forget about fighting colonialism. If you are fighting capitalism, you tend to forget about fighting uh, homophobia and so on. And yet, for an activist community to be successful, you need to be aware that there are more than one uh, oppressive system out there and that you're fighting them all or you're reproducing most except for the one that you're fighting. <coughs> yes. This is really, uh, thanks. Um, I always 
I always come <coughs> to lectures of this sort, even even yours, with the idea that I'm pretty much going to know everything that you have to say, <laughs> and it's never true. You always you always stimulate me, so thanks. Um, wow, thank you. The um, <coughs> this is undigested, but I'm wondering if one of the I'm interested in our strategies. So accepting what you've said um, and <coughs> looking at our various organizations, looking at the coalitions or the lack of coalitions or whatever, I'm wondering if by expanding, as many people are trying to do, expanding the concept of queer, um, if we can, uh, those of us who, who work on Palestinian issues, can, uh, whether queer in the narrow sense of the word or not, mm -hmm. uh, can refer to ourselves as queer and talk about um, look uh, talk about the Palestinian lens as being queer and to try to proceed on that uh, on that level and with that strategy. If that might be, was that completely inarticulate? No, I, no it's not. It's not. It's, it's a treacherous slope because uh, well, which claiming not on a queerness slope? without the experience, the daily lived experience of queerness, is you know. But but when 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 Jack Halberstam talks about, you know, I didn't mean this in any kind of colonizing or occupying the the uh, identity of queer. But when, when someone like Jack Halberstam mm -hmm. talks about all of us looking at film uh, from a queer lens, then uh, if we were to follow her strategy, we would all be then uh, engaging in this treacherous, uh, and, and I knew before I said it that this is a slippery slope, um, <laughs> of colonizing versus um, attempting to um, but do we all look at film from a queer perspective? No. I mean, some people are so grounded in the straight that they can't. No, of course we don't, but I'm suggesting, as she was okay. suggesting, that we do. That if, if the uh, position on mm -hmm. uh, Palestinian rights and activism, say, in the United States, just taking the U.S., is such a minority position and viewed as such a weird position, by uh, an awful lot of people, um, a out of outside the margins position, and so mm -hmm. on. Why can't it then be uh, a queer position? Uh, so that's that's all I'm suggesting. Did you want to respond to that? Yeah, or to that? Well, uh, what I was thinking is that you know because queer is now uh, both a kind of analytic, but it has also become a kind of identity category, right? And you know, we can't. Um, <coughs> you know, um, dismiss that because it is important. Um, what if um, instead of using the term queer, we use say non-normative, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. you know, and that could account for a, a variety of you know dissident what Gayatri Gopinath calls you know dis dissident you know desires mm -hmm. and you know identities mm -hmm. that are not you know, commensurate to gay, lesbian, or maybe even queer. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we can also talk about non-normativity, both in terms of non-heteronormativity, but also yes. non-homonormativity. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So Absolutely. maybe that's a, be that's a better yeah. term. Yeah. And so I think that's, that's something that the Palestinian, you know, like the, su uh, a group such as al Kaus is very much involved in articulating that analysis. So, you know, it's, it's a, it, I do see a treacherous slope. I don't necessarily ever want to say, oh, that's the queer perspective. And, queer analysis and queer reading and whatever, mm -hmm. uh, because I would like a lot more uh, solid, informed analysis of that. But, but you may. Oh, Grace as, Hong, Grace Hong. As Grace Hong was saying, basically, uh, there is that, that analysis is taking place already, and uh, with groups such as al who are very much re-envisioning. What would it mean? What would it mean to have a queer redefinition of sovereignty, for example. It means non homonormative as much as non heteronormative. It means shatter completely shattering the binaries, not just of hetero and not, but also of the, the, the binary that is there in homonormativity, too. Mm -hmm. So that now we assume that this is the new normal. And we also have to move away from that. Michelle. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I just wanted to jump in on the conversation with 
grace and sondering and stuff. And I went to a, um, a seminar in Sam Sandin, and he was talking, he took the concept of passing from the context of queer theorizing and turned it instead to thinking about a collective refusal to see. So rather than it being an individual identitarian practice that actually was the collective mm -hmm. around who were participating in this kind of passing activity. So I think the idea of thinking about using queer theories in terms of like even the women just refusing that e the desire to pass even in terms of the people's response to like making really visible. Mm -hmm. I mean, so instead of putting it in the like minority site, it's like I'm being the, the ones in the queer position, then it's the queer in the reversal, is that what you're saying? Well, I think that's what he was suggesting yesterday, yeah. that rather than an individual passing as straight or as feminine or something that it's seen to be passing as a kind of social activity that is around collectively refusing to see. Yeah. Rather than an, an, an individual performing a difference. So, anyway, I just thought it kind of added uh, what you were about to say. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, my question is uh, you probably addressed it in some way, but I was uh, kind of interested if there are any groups inside of Israel who are kind of uh, trying to ally themselves in. Mm -hmm. uh, with El Paso or Missouri or, or you know, Cruz and Diaspora who are actively resisting uh, this kind of pinkwashing. And I know that it's like, it's, it negates their existence as liberal or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I'm just kind of interested if there are any, if you know of any, that you've been a part of The name escapes me. There is one group. I mean, it's not, you know, there are a lot of Israeli queers, individuals. Mm -hmm. As far as groups, there is one, and the name escapes me, and that's that's it. Oh, do you know? <laughs> but as far as the individual, individual queer Israelis, yes. Groups, I don't know. I think, as I said, there is one, and the name escapes me, so obviously I'm not too familiar with it. Yes. Um, I just wanted to add to the previous conversation that there are queer people that are Zionist and like pro-Israel mm -hmm. and not on board with, you know, free Palestine. So, so coming from like the queering, I don't know how you framed it, but like the queering lens of Palestine for me doesn't fit well because, you know, there's there's a lot of LGBT orgs that mm -hmm. will support Israel. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean. That's why Michael Lucas is so popular. He's totally a queer Zionist. And he has a huge following. And that's why there was a huge battle in New York over whether Sarah Sherman would be allowed to read in that center, which is the LGBT center in New York. Clearly, the majority was Zionist, or they would not have shut down Sarah Sherman's book on queer, uh, the queer international. Well, you're mentioning lupus um, reminded me since I, I this is another unpopular statement um, <laughs> just to be moderately provocative. You know, those of us who are in the BDS uh, movement uh, insist, most of us insist that these are instant boycott movement, that these are institutional boycotts. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm thinking, I don't know really, I'm, I'm thinking that in terms of the academic and cultural boycotts, and to some extent with the cultural boycotts, we have moved more towards uh, boycotting individuals. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering, we're walking a very, uh, it seems to me we're walking a very delicate line here in which we, most of us continue to say, oh no, this is just an institutional boycott. Uh, I don't think it is anymore. And with this issue, I'm wondering, uh, or I don't think it should be in that way, not to speak to it for other people. And I think this, this pinkwashing, um, for reasons I can't explain right now, just lit up in my head with regard to individual uh, boycotting. Mm -hmm. um, I think this doesn't, doesn't fit, but I mean, characters like him 
um, more than just cultural characters, but um, you know, political activism. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's my point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's your taxi waiting for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not gonna be planned somehow. It's my son. Oh. All right, let's go back to <laughs> uh, institutional versus individual. The guidelines are absolutely for an institutional uh, boycott. However, the guidelines also say that if as an individual you are representing the official Zionist uh, line and if as an individual you are uh, promoting the Israeli uh, propaganda, then you as an individual are subject to boycott. So for example, Idan Rachel. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about the fact the uh, guidelines? Yes. Yeah. So okay. for example, Idan Rachel who is actually an individual, he's an artist, he performs, he plays music. However, he also is a cultural ambassador. He is there to project the beautiful face of Israel. You know, like Joel Lyra said, he's one of the cool good people. He's got long dreads, he plays good uh, fusion music. So he becomes a cultural ambassador, and yes, he is an, an individual, not an institution, but he is subject to our culture. So the guidelines do say, that if you as an individual are representing the official discourse, then you as an individual are subject to boycott. So you're not violating the guidelines when you say, I will boycott Idan Rachel, rather than I will boycott the Becheva dance troupe. Because sometimes it's not just the Israeli Philharmonic, it is individuals who are representing the Israeli government. And you know, so, so yes, it becomes individual, but it is not because the person is Israeli, it is because the person is representing the Zionist narrative. Yes. I think sometimes, however, yeah. we know that that is the, the, the intention, and that very often those people are connected in one way or another with an institution supported by the same government. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes the language there's a conflation of the boycott of the individuals, the cultural ambassador, and normalization. And I think that's where there gets to be some confusion for people out there. Because sometimes people are arguing against normalization mm -hmm. rather than focusing on why this individual is part of cultural boycott. Yeah, and uh, you know, one of the main goals of BDS is educating people. I mean, you know, when you think of boycott, for example, and I always say that when I'm, I'm, when I'm speaking as a boycott organizer, no amount of boycotting every single product on Israeli shelves is going to make a dent in how much the U.S. gives to Israel. You know, when you think of the 10 billions a year, you can boycott every single Israeli product on every single shelf in every single grocery store, and you're not going to make a dent in that. The dent that you're making in it is in education. Why am I boycotting a product at Trader Joe's? And you explain. So this is where you know you're explaining why am I boycotting this person? Normalization. What is normalization? What is boycott? And it's part of the awareness. You know, boycott is a tool of, of as a strategy. One of the very uh, one of the ob objectives of boycott that are not necessarily one of the three goals listed mm -hmm. is educating and awareness. And so when these moments happen where it's like, why am I boycotting? This is an anti-Semitic, am I boycotting because of Israel? Am I boycotting, what is normalization? What does normalization mean? Why am I, sh why should I not? Then that's, well, you are actually engaging in BDS by educating. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, can we thank Professor Adia one more time? Thank you all of you for talking. Please, please, please help yourself.